Insurance Insurance is a means of protection from financial loss. It is a form of risk management, primarily used to hedge against the risk of a contingent or uncertain loss. An entity which provides insurance is known as an insurer, insurance company, insurance carrier or underwriter. A person or entity who buys insurance is known as an insured or as a policyholder. The insurance transaction involves the insured assuming a guaranteed and known relatively small loss in the form of payment to the insurer in exchange for the insurer's promise to compensate the insured in the event of a covered loss. The loss may or may not be financial, but it must be reducible to financial terms, and usually involves something in which the insured has an insurable interest established by ownership, possession, or pre-existing relationship. The insured receives a contract, called the insurance policy, which details the conditions and circumstances under which the insurer will compensate the insured. The amount of money charged by the insurer to the insured for the coverage set forth in the insurance policy is called the premium. If the insured experiences a loss which is potentially covered by the insurance policy, the insured submits a claim to the insurer for processing by a claims adjuster. The insurer may hedge its own risk by taking out reinsurance whereby another insurance company agrees to carry some of the risk, especially if the primary insurer deems the risk too large for it to carry. Methods for transferring or distributing risk were practiced by Chinese and Babylonian traders as long ago as the 3rd and 2nd millennia BC, respectively. Chinese merchants traveling treacherous river rapids would redistribute their wares across many vessels to limit the loss due to any single vessel's capsizing. The Babylonians developed a system which was recorded in the famous Code of Hammurabi circa 1750 BC, and practiced by early Mediterranean sailing merchants. If a merchant received a loan to fund his shipment, he would pay the lender an additional sum in exchange for the lender's guarantee to cancel the loan should the shipment be stolen, or lost at sea. Circa 800 BC, the inhabitants of Rhodes created the general average. This allowed groups of merchants to pay to ensure their goods being shipped together. The collected premiums would be used to reimburse any merchant whose goods were jettisoned during transport, whether due to storm or sinkage. Separate insurance contracts, i.e., insurance policies not bundled with loans or other kinds of contracts, were invented in Genoa in the 14th century, as were insurance pools backed by pledges of landed estates. The first known insurance contract dates from Genoa in 1347. And in the next century maritime insurance had developed widely and premiums were intuitively varied with risks. These new insurance contracts allowed insurance to be separated from investment, a separation of roles that first proved useful in marine insurance. Insurance became far more sophisticated in Enlightenment-era Europe, and specialized varieties developed. Property insurance as we know it today can be traced to the Great Fire of London which in 1666 devoured more than 13,000 houses. The devastating effects of the fire converted the development of insurance from a matter of convenience into one of urgency, a change of opinion reflected in Sir Christopher Wren's inclusion of a site for the insurance office in his new plan for London in 1667. A number of attempted fire insurance schemes came to nothing, but in 1681, economist Nicholas Barbin and 11 associates established the first fire insurance company the insurance office for houses, at the back of the Royal Exchange to insure brick and frame homes. Initially, 5,000 homes were insured by his insurance office. At the same time, the first insurance schemes for the underwriting of business ventures became available. By the end of the 17th century, London's growing importance as a center for trade was increasing demand for marine insurance. In the late 1680s, Edward Lloyd opened a coffee house, which became the meeting place for parties in the shipping industry wishing to insure cargoes and ships, and those willing to underwrite such ventures. These informal beginnings led to the establishment of the insurance market Lloyd's of London and several related shipping and insurance businesses. The first life insurance policies were taken out in the early 18th century. The first company to offer life insurance was the Amicable Society for a Perpetual Assurance Office founded in London in 1706 by William Talbot and Sir Thomas Allen. Edward Romoris established the Society for Equitable Assurances on Lives and Survivorship in 1762. It was the world's first mutual insurer and it pioneered age-based premiums based on mortality rate laying the framework for scientific insurance practice and development and the basis of modern life assurance upon which all life assurance schemes were subsequently based. In the late 19th century accident insurance began to become available. The first company to offer accident insurance was the Railway Passengers Assurance Company, 
formed in 1848 in England to ensure against the rising number of fatalities on the nascent railway system. By the late 19th century governments began to initiate national insurance programs against sickness and old age. Germany built on a tradition of welfare programs in Prussia and Saxony that began as early as in the 1840s. In the 1880s Chancellor Otto von Bismarck introduced old age pensions, accident insurance and medical care had formed the basis for Germany's welfare state. In Britain more extensive legislation was introduced by the Liberal government in the 1911 National Insurance Act. This gave the British working classes the first contributory system of insurance against illness and unemployment. This system was greatly expanded after the Second World War under the influence of the Beveridge Report, to form the first modern welfare state. Insurance involves pooling funds from many insured entities, known as exposures, to pay for the losses that some may incur. The insured entities are therefore protected from risk for a fee, with the fee being dependent upon the frequency and severity of the event occurring. In order to be an insurable risk, the risk insured against must meet certain characteristics. Insurance as a financial intermediary is a commercial enterprise and a major part of the financial services industry. But individual entities can also self-insure through saving money for possible future losses. Risk which can be insured by private companies typically shares seven common characteristics. When a company insures an individual entity, there are basic legal requirements and regulations. Several commonly cited legal principles of insurance include To indemnify means to make whole again, or to be reinstated to the position that one was in, to the extent possible prior to the happening of a specified event or peril. Accordingly, life insurance is generally not considered to be indemnity insurance, but rather contingent insurance, i.e., a claim arises on the occurrence of a specified event. There are generally three types of insurance contracts that seek to indemnify an insured. From an insured standpoint, the result is usually the same, the insurer pays the loss and claims expenses. If the insured has a reimbursement policy, the insured can be required to pay for a loss and then be reimbursed by the insurance carrier for the loss and out-of-pocket costs including, with the permission of the insurer, claim expenses. Under a pay-on-behalf policy, the insurance carrier would defend and pay a claim on behalf of the insured who would not be out-of-pocket for anything. Most modern liability insurance is written on the basis of pay-on-behalf language which enables the insurance carrier to manage and control the claim. Under an indemnification policy, the insurance carrier can generally either reimburse or pay on behalf of, whichever is more beneficial to it and the insured in the claim handling process. An entity seeking to transfer risk, an individual, corporation, or association of any type, etc., becomes the insured party once risk is assumed by an insurer, the insuring party, by means of a contract, called an insurance policy. Generally, an insurance contract includes, at a minimum, the following elements identification of participating parties, the insurer, the insured, the beneficiaries, the premium, the period of coverage, the particular loss event covered, the amount of coverage, i.e., the amount to be paid to the insured or beneficiary in the event of a loss, and exclusions, events not covered. An insured is thus said to be indemnified against loss covered in the policy. When insured parties experience a loss for a specified peril, the coverage entitles the policyholder to make a claim against the insurer for the covered amount of losses specified by the policy. The fee paid by the insured to the insurer for assuming the risk is called the premium. Insurance premiums from many insureds are used to fund accounts reserved for later payment of claims, in theory for a relatively few claimants, and for overhead costs. So long as an insurer maintains adequate funds set aside for anticipated losses, called reserves, the remaining margin is an insurer's profit. Insurance can have various effects on society through the way that it changes who bears the cost of losses and damage. On one hand it can increase fraud, on the other it can help societies and individuals prepare for catastrophes and mitigate the effects of catastrophes on both households and societies. Insurance can influence the probability of losses through moral hazard, insurance fraud, and preventive steps by the insurance company. Insurance scholars have typically used moral hazard to refer to the increased loss due to unintentional carelessness and insurance fraud to refer to increased risk due to intentional carelessness or indifference. Insurers attempt to address carelessness through inspections, policy provisions requiring certain types of maintenance, and possible discounts for loss mitigation efforts. 
While in theory insurers could encourage investment in loss reduction, some commentators have argued that in practice the insurers had historically not aggressively pursued loss control measures, particularly to prevent disaster losses such as hurricanes, because of concerns over rate reductions and legal battles. However, since about 1996 insurers have begun to take a more active role in loss mitigation, such as through building codes. According to the study books of the Chartered Insurance Institute, there are variant methods of insurance as follows. The business model is to collect more in premium and investment income than is paid out in losses, and to also offer a competitive price which consumers will accept. Profit can be reduced to a simple equation. Insurers make money in two ways. The most complicated aspect of the insurance business is the actuarial science of rate making, price setting, of policies, which uses statistics and probability to approximate the rate of future claims based on a given risk. After producing rates, the insurer will use discretion to reject or accept risks through the underwriting process. At the most basic level, initial rate making involves looking at the frequency and severity of insured perils and the expected average payout resulting from these perils. Thereafter, an insurance company will collect historical loss data, bring the loss data to present value, and compare these prior losses to the premium collected in order to assess rate adequacy. Loss ratios and expense loads are also used. Rating for different risk characteristics involves at the most basic level comparing the loss with loss relativities a policy with twice as many losses would therefore be charged twice as much. More complex multivariate analyses are sometimes used when multiple characteristics are involved and a univariate analysis could produce confounded results. Other statistical methods may be used in assessing the probability of future losses. Upon termination of a given policy. The amount of premium collected minus the amount paid out in claims is the insurer's underwriting profit on that policy. Underwriting performance is measured by something called the combined ratio, which is the ratio of expenses slash losses to premiums. A combined ratio of less than 100% indicates an underwriting profit, while anything over 100 indicates an underwriting loss. A company with a combined ratio over 100% may nevertheless remain profitable due to investment earnings. Insurance companies earn investment profits on float. Float, or available reserve, is the amount of money on hand at any given moment that an insurer has collected in insurance premiums but has not paid out in claims. Insurers start investing insurance premiums as soon as they are collected and continue to earn interest or other income on them until claims are paid out. The Association of British Insurers, gathering 400 insurance companies and 94% of UK insurance services, has almost 20% of the investments in the London Stock Exchange. In the United States, the underwriting loss of property and casualty insurance companies was $142.3 billion in the five years ending 2003. But overall profit for the same period was $68.4 billion, as the result of float. Some insurance industry insiders, most notably Hank Greenberg, do not believe that it is forever possible to sustain a profit from float without an underwriting profit as well, but this opinion is not universally held. Naturally, the float method is difficult to carry out in an economically depressed period. Bear markets do cause insurers to shift away from investments and to toughen up their underwriting standards, so a poor economy generally means high insurance premiums. This tendency to swing between profitable and unprofitable periods over time is commonly known as the underwriting, or insurance, cycle. Claims and loss handling is the materialized utility of insurance, it is the actual product paid for. Claims may be filed by insureds directly with the insurer or through brokers or agents. The insurer may require that the claim be filed on its own proprietary forms, or may accept claims on a standard industry form, such as those produced by a court. Insurance company claims departments employ a large number of claims adjusters supported by a staff of records management and data entry clerks. Incoming claims are classified based on severity and are assigned to adjusters whose settlement authority varies with their knowledge and experience. The adjuster undertakes an investigation of each claim, usually in close cooperation with the insured, determines if coverage is available under the terms of the insurance contract, and if so, the reasonable monetary value of the claim, and authorizes payment. The policyholder may hire their own public adjuster to negotiate the settlement with the insurance company on their behalf. For policies that are complicated, where claims may be complex, the insured may take out a separate insurance policy add-on, called loss recovery insurance, which covers the cost of a public adjuster in the case of a claim.
Adjusting liability insurance claims is particularly difficult because there is a third party involved, the plaintiff, who is under no contractual obligation to cooperate with the insurer and may in fact regard the insurer as a deep pocket. The adjuster must obtain legal counsel for the insured, either inside house counsel or outside panel counsel, monitor litigation that may take years to complete, and appear in person or over the telephone with settlement authority at a mandatory settlement conference when requested by the judge. If a claims adjuster suspects under insurance, the condition of average may come into play to limit the insurance company's exposure. In managing the claims handling function, insurers seek to balance the elements of customer satisfaction, administrative handling expenses, and claims overpayment leakages. As part of this balancing act, fraudulent insurance practices are a major business risk that must be managed and overcome. Disputes between insurers and insureds over the validity of claims or claims handling practices occasionally escalate into litigation. See insurance bad faith. Insurers will often use insurance agents to initially market or underwrite their customers. Agents can be captive, meaning they write only for one company, or independent, meaning that they can issue policies from several companies. The existence and success of companies using insurance agents is likely due to improved and personalized service. Companies also use broking firms, banks and other corporate entities, like self-help groups, microfinance institutions, NGOs etc to market their products. Any risk that can be quantified can potentially be insured. Specific kinds of risk that may give rise to claims are known as perils. An insurance policy will set out in detail which perils are covered by the policy and which are not. Below are non-exhaustive lists of the many different types of insurance that exist. A single policy that may cover risks in one or more of the categories set out below. For example, vehicle insurance would typically cover both the proper to risk theft or damage to the vehicle, and the liability risk, legal claims arising from an accident. A home insurance policy in the United States typically includes coverage for damage to the home and the owner's belongings, certain legal claims against the owner, and even a small amount of coverage for medical expenses of guests who are injured on the owner's property. Business insurance can take a number of different forms, such as the various kinds of professional liability insurance, also called professional indemnity, PI which are discussed below under that name, and the business owner's policy, BOP, which packages into one policy many of the kinds of coverage that a business owner needs, in a way analogous to how homeowners insurance packages the coverages that a homeowner needs. Auto insurance protects the policyholder against financial loss in the event of an incident involving a vehicle they own, such as in a traffic collision. Coverage typically includes Gap insurance covers the excess amount on your auto loan in an instance where your insurance company does not cover the entire loan. Depending on the company's specific policies, it might or might not cover the deductible as well. This coverage is marketed for those who put low down payments, have high interest rates on their loans, and those with 60 month or longer terms. Gap insurance is typically offered by a finance company when the vehicle owner purchases their vehicle, but many auto insurance companies offer this coverage to consumers as well. Health insurance policies cover the cost of medical treatments. Dental insurance, like medical insurance, protects policyholders for dental costs. In most developed countries, all citizens receive some health coverage from their governments, paid for by taxation. In most countries, health insurance is often part of an employer's benefits. Casualty insurance insures against accidents, not necessarily tied to any specific property. It is a broad spectrum of insurance that a number of other types of insurance could be classified, such as auto, workers' compensation, and some liability insurances. Life insurance provides a monetary benefit to a decedent's family or other designated beneficiary, and may specifically provide for income to an insured person's family, burial, funeral and other final expenses. Life insurance policies often allow the option of having the proceeds paid to the beneficiary either in a lump sum cash payment or an annuity. In most states, a person cannot purchase a policy on another person without their knowledge. Annuities provide a stream of payments and are generally classified as insurance because they are issued by insurance companies, are regulated as insurance, and require the same kinds of actuarial and investment management expertise that life insurance requires. Annuities and pensions that pay a benefit for life are sometimes regarded as insurance against the possibility that a retiree will outlive his or her financial resources. In that sense, they are the complement of life insurance and, from an underwriting perspective, 
are the mirror image of life insurance. Certain life insurance contracts accumulate cash values, which may be taken by the insured if the policy is surrendered or which may be borrowed against some policies, such as annuities and endowment policies, are financial instruments to accumulate or liquidate wealth when it is needed. In many countries, such as the United States and the UK, the tax law provides that the interest on this cash value is not taxable under certain circumstances. This leads to widespread use of life insurance as a tax efficient method of saving as well as protection in the event of early death. In the United States, the tax on interest income on life insurance policies and annuities is generally deferred. However, in some cases, the benefit derived from tax deferral may be offset by a low return. This depends upon the insuring company, the type of policy and other variables, mortality, market return, etc. Moreover, other income tax saving vehicles, for example, IRAs, 401k plans, Roth IRAs, may be better alternatives for value accumulation. Burial insurance is a very old type of life insurance which is paid out upon death to cover final expenses, such as the cost of a funeral. The Greeks and Romans introduced burial insurance circa 600 CE when they organized guilds called benevolent societies which cared for the surviving families and paid funeral expenses of members upon death. Guilds in the Middle Ages served a similar purpose, as did friendly societies during Victorian times. Property insurance provides protection against risks to property such as fire, theft or weather damage. This may include specialized forms of insurance such as fire insurance, flood insurance, earthquake insurance, home insurance, inland marine insurance or boiler insurance. The term property insurance may, like casualty insurance, be used as a broad category of various subtypes of insurance, some of which are listed below. Liability insurance is a very broad superset that covers legal claims against the insured. Many types of insurance include an aspect of liability coverage. For example, a homeowner's insurance policy will normally include liability coverage which protects the insured in the event of a claim brought by someone who slips and falls on the property. Automobile insurance also includes an aspect of liability insurance that indemnifies against the harm that a crashing car can cause to others' lives, health, or property. The protection offered by a liability insurance policy is twofold. A legal defense in the event of a lawsuit commenced against the policyholder on indemnification, payment on behalf of the insured, with respect to a settlement or court verdict. Liability policies typically cover only the negligence of the insured, and will not apply to results of willful or intentional acts by the insured. Often the commercial insured's liability insurance program consists of several layers. The first layer of insurance generally consists of primary insurance, which provides first dollar indemnity for judgments and settlements up to the limits of liability of the primary policy. Generally, primary insurance is subject to a deductible and obligates the insured to defend the insured against lawsuits, which is normally accomplished by assigning counsel to defend the insured. In many instances, a commercial insured may elect to self insure. Above the primary insurance or self insured retention, the insured may have one or more layers off excess insurance to provide coverage additional limits of indemnity protection. There are a variety of types of excess insurance, including standalone excess policies policies that contain their own terms, conditions, and exclusions, follow form excess insurance, policies that follow the terms of the underlying policy except as specifically provided, and umbrella insurance policies, excess insurance that in some circumstances could provide coverage that is broader than the underlying insurance. Credit insurance repays some or all of a loan when the borrower is insolvent. Some communities prefer to create virtual insurance amongst themselves by other means than contractual risk transfer, which assigns explicit numerical values to risk. A number of religious groups, including the Amish and some Muslim groups, depend on support provided by their communities when disasters strike. The risk presented by any given person is assumed collectively by the community who all bear the cost of rebuilding lost property and supporting people whose needs are suddenly greater after a loss of some kind. In supportive communities where others can be trusted to follow community leaders, this tacit form of insurance can work. In this manner the community can even out the extreme differences in insurability that exist among its members. Some further justification is also provided by invoking moral hazard of explicit insurance contracts. In the United Kingdom, the Crown, which, for practical purposes, meant the civil service, did not insure property such as government buildings. If a government building was damaged, the cost of repair would be met from public funds because, in the long run, 
This was cheaper than paying insurance premiums. Since many UK government buildings have been sold to property companies and rented back, this arrangement is now less common and may have disappeared altogether. In the United States, the most prevalent form of self insurance is governmental risk management pools. They are self funded cooperatives, operating as carriers of coverage for the majority of governmental entities today, such as county governments, municipalities, and school districts. Rather than these entities independently self-insure on risk bankruptcy from a large judgment or catastrophic loss, such governmental entities form a risk pool. Such pools begin their operations by capitalization through member deposits or bond issuance. Coverage, such as general liability, auto liability, professional liability, workers' compensation, and property, is offered by the pool to its members, similar to coverage offered by insurance companies. However, Self-insured pools offer members lower rates, due to not needing insurance brokers, increased benefits, such as loss prevention services, and subject matter expertise. Of approximately 91,000 distinct governmental entities operating in the United States, 75,000 are members of self-insured pools in various lines of coverage, forming approximately 500 pools. Although a relatively small corner of the insurance market, the annual contributions, self-insured premiums, to such pools have been estimated up to $17 billion annually. Insurance companies may sell any combination of insurance types, but are often classified into three groups. General insurance companies can be further divided into these subcategories. In most countries, life and non-life insurers are subject to different regulatory regimes and different tax and accounting rules. The main reason for the distinction between the two types of company is that life, annuity, and pension business is very long-term in nature. Coverage for life assurance or a pension can cover risks over many decades. By contrast, non-life insurance cover usually covers a shorter period, such as one year. Insurance companies are generally classified as either mutual or proprietary companies. Mutual companies are owned by the policyholders, while shareholders, who may or may not own policies, own proprietary insurance companies. Demutualization of mutual insurers to form stock companies, as well as the formation of a hybrid known as a mutual holding company, became common in some countries, such as the United States, in the late 20th century. However, not all states permit mutual holding companies. Other possible forms for an insurance company include reciprocals, in which policyholders reciprocate in sharing risks, and Lloyd's organizations. Insurance companies are rated by various agencies such as AM Best. The ratings include the company's financial strength, which measures its ability to pay claims. It also rates financial instruments issued by the insurance company, such as bonds, notes, and securitization products. Reinsurance companies are insurance companies that sell policies to other insurance companies, allowing them to reduce their risks and protect themselves from their large losses. The reinsurance market is dominated by a few very large companies, with huge reserves. A reinsurer may also be a direct writer of insurance risks as well. Captive insurance companies may be defined as limited-purpose insurance companies established with the specific objective of financing risks emanating from their parent group or groups. This definition can sometimes be extended to include some of the risks of the parent company's customers. In short, it is an in-house self-insurance vehicle. Captives may take the form of a pure entity, which is a 100% subsidiary of the self-insured parent company, of a mutual captive, which insures the collective risks of members of an industry, and of an association captive, which self-insures individual risks of the members of a professional, commercial or industrial association. Captives represent commercial, economic and tax advantages to their sponsors because of the reductions in costs they help create and for the ease of insurance risk management and the flexibility for cash flows they generate. Additionally, they may provide coverage of risks which is neither available nor offered in the traditional insurance market at reasonable prices. The types of risk that a captive can underwrite for their parents include property damage, public and product liability, professional indemnity, employee benefits, employer's liability, motor and medical aid expenses. The captive's exposure to such risks may be limited by the use of reinsurance. Captives are becoming an increasingly important component of the risk management and risk financing strategy of their parent. This can be understood against the following background. There are also companies known as insurance consultants. Like a mortgage broker, 
These companies are paid a fee by the customer to shop around for the best insurance policy amongst many companies. Similar to an insurance consultant, an insurance broker also shops around for the best insurance policy amongst many companies. However, with insurance brokers, the fee is usually paid in the form of commission from the insurer that is selected rather than directly from the client. Neither insurance consultants nor insurance brokers are insurance companies and no risks are transferred to them in insurance transactions. Third party administrators are companies that perform underwriting and sometimes claims handling services for insurance companies. These companies often have special expertise that the insurance companies do not have. The financial stability and strength of an insurance company should be a major consideration when buying an insurance contract. An insurance premium paid currently provides coverage for losses that might arise many years in the future. For that reason, the viability of the insurance carrier is very important. In recent years, a number of insurance companies have become insolvent, leaving their policyholders with no coverage, or coverage only from a government backhead insurance pool or other arrangement with less attractive payouts for losses. A number of independent rating agencies provide information and rate the financial viability of insurance companies. Global insurance premiums grew by 2.7% in inflation-adjusted terms in 2010 to $4.3 trillion, climbing above pre-crisis levels. The return to growth in record premiums generated during the year followed two years of decline in real terms. Life insurance premiums increased by 3.2% in 2010 and non-life premiums by 2.1%. While industrialized countries saw an increase in premiums of around 1.4%, insurance markets in emerging economies saw rapid expansion with 11% growth in premium income. The global insurance industry was sufficiently capitalized to withstand the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009 and most insurance companies restored their capital to pre-crisis levels by the end of 2010. With the continuation of the gradual recovery of the global economy. It is likely the insurance industry will continue to see growth in premium income both in industrialized countries and emerging markets in 2011. Advanced economies account for the bulk of global insurance. With premium income of $1.62 trillion, Europe was the most important region in 2010, followed by North America $1.409 trillion and Asia $1.161 trillion. Europe has however seen a decline in premium income during the year in contrast to the growth seen in North America and Asia. The top four countries generated more than a half of premiums. The United States and Japan alone accounted for 40% of world insurance, much higher than their 7% share of the global population. Emerging economies accounted for over 85% of the world's population but only around 15% of premiums. Their markets are however growing at a quicker pace. The country expected to have the biggest impact on the insurance share distribution across the world is China. According to Sam Radwin of Enhance International LLC, low premium penetration, insurance premium is a percent of GDP, an aging population and the largest car market in terms of new sales, premium growth has averaged 15 to 20 percent in the past five years, and China is expected to be the largest insurance market in the next decade or two. In the United States, insurance is regulated by the states under the McCarran-Ferguson Act, with periodic proposals for federal intervention, and a non-profit coalition of state insurance agencies called the National Association of Insurance Commissioners works to harmonize the country's different laws and regulations. The National Conference of Insurance Legislators, NCOIL, also works to harmonize the different state laws. In the European Union, the Third Non-Life Directive and the Third Life Directive, both passed in 1992 and effective 1994, created a single insurance market in Europe and allowed insurance companies to offer insurance anywhere in the EU, subject to permission from authority in the head office, and allowed insurance consumers to purchase insurance from any insurer in the EU. As far as insurance in the United Kingdom, the Financial Services Authority took over insurance regulation from the General Insurance Standards Council in 2005. Laws passed include the Insurance Companies Act 1973 and another in 1982, and reforms to warranty and other aspects under discussion. The insurance industry in China was nationalized in 1949 and thereafter offered by only a single state-owned company, the People's Insurance Company of China, which was eventually suspended as demand declined in a communist environment. In 1978, Market reforms led to an increase in the market and by 1995 a comprehensive insurance law of the People's Republic of China was passed, followed in 1998 by the formation of China Insurance Regulatory Commission, CIRC, 
which has broad regulatory authority over the insurance market of China. In India IRDA's Insurance Regulatory Authority As per the Section 4 of IRDA Act 1999, Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority, IRDA, which was constituted be an Act of Parliament. National Insurance Academy, Pune is Apex Insurance Capacity Builder Institute promoted with support from Ministry of Finance and by LIC, Life and General Insurance Companies. In 2017, within the framework of the joint project of the Bank of Russia and Yandex, a special check mark, a green circle with a tick and, Unified State Register of Insurance Entities, text box, appeared in the search for Yandex system, informing the consumer that the company's financial services are offered on the market website, which has the status of an insurance company, a broker or a mutual insurance association. Insurance is just a risk transfer mechanism wherein the financial burden which may arise due to some fortuitous event is transferred to a bigger entity called an insurance company by way of paying premiums. This only reduces the financial burden and not the actual chances of happening of an event. Insurance is a risk for both the insurance company and the insured. The insurance company understands the risk involved and will perform a risk assessment when writing the policy. As a result, the premiums may go up if they determine that the policyholder will file a claim. If a person is financially stable and plans for life's unexpected events, they may be able to go without insurance. However, they must have enough to cover a total and complete loss of employment and of their possessions. Some states will accept a surety bond, a government bond, or even making a cash deposit with a state. An insurance company may inadvertently find that its insureds may not be as risk averse as they might otherwise be, since, by definition, the insured has transferred risk to the insurer, a concept known as moral hazard. This insulates many from the true costs of living with risk negating measures that can mitigate or adapt to risk and leading some to describe insurance schemes as potentially maladaptive. To reduce their own financial exposure, insurance companies have contractual clauses that mitigate their obligation to provide coverage if the insured engages in behavior that grossly magnifies their risk of loss or liability. For example, life insurance companies may require higher premiums or deny coverage altogether to people who work in hazardous occupations or engage in dangerous sports. Liability insurance providers do not provide coverage for liability arising from intentional torts committed by or at the direction of the insured. Even if a provider desired to provide such coverage, it is against the public policy of most countries to allow such insurance to exist, and thus it is usually illegal. Insurance policies can be complex and some policyholders may not understand all the fees and coverages included in a policy. As a result, people may buy policies on unfavorable terms. In response to these issues, many countries have enacted detailed statutory and regulatory regimes governing every aspect of the insurance business, including minimum standards for policies and the ways in which they may be advertised and sold. For example, most insurance policies in the English language today have been carefully drafted in plain English. The industry learned the hard way that many courts will not enforce policies against insureds when the judges themselves cannot understand what the policies are saying. Typically, Courts construe ambiguities in insurance policies against the insurance company and in favor of coverage under the policy. Many institutional insurance purchasers buy insurance through an insurance broker. While on the surface it appears the broker represents the buyer, not the insurance company, and typically counsels the buyer on appropriate coverage and policy limitations, in the vast majority of cases a broker's compensation comes in the form of a commission as a percentage of the insurance premium creating a conflict of interest in that the broker's financial interest is tilted towards encouraging an insured to purchase more insurance than might be necessary at a higher price. A broker generally holds contracts with many insurers, thereby allowing the broker to shop the market for the best rates and coverage possible. Insurance may also be purchased through an agent. A tied agent, working exclusively with one insurer, represents the insurance company from whom the policyholder buys, while a free agent sells policies of various insurance companies. Just as there is a potential conflict of interest with a broker, an agent has a different type of conflict. Because agents work directly for the insurance company, if there is a claim the agent may advise the client to the benefit of the insurance company. Agents generally cannot offer as broad a range of selection compared to an insurance broker. An independent insurance consultant advises insureds on a fee-for-service retainer, similar to an attorney, and thus offers completely independent advice, free of the financial conflict of interest of brokers or agents. However, 
such a consultant must still work through brokers or agents in order to secure coverage for their clients. In the United States, economists and consumer advocates generally consider insurance to be worthwhile for low probability, catastrophic losses, but not for high probability, small losses. Because of this, consumers are advised to select high deductibles and to not insure losses which would not cause a disruption in their life. However, consumers have shown a tendency to prefer low deductibles and to prefer to insure relatively high probability, small losses over low probability perhaps due to not understanding or ignoring the low probability risk. This is associated with reduced purchasing of insurance against low probability losses, and may result in increased inefficiencies from moral hazard. Redlining is the practice of denying insurance coverage in specific geographic areas, supposedly because of a high likelihood of loss, while the alleged motivation is unlawful discrimination. Racial profiling or redlining has a long history in the property insurance industry in the United States. From a review of industry underwriting and marketing materials, court documents, and research by government agencies, industry and community groups, and academics, it is clear that race has long affected and continues to affect the policies and practices of the insurance industry. In July 2007, the Federal Trade Commission, FTC, released a report presenting the results of a study concerning credit-based insurance scores in automobile insurance. The study found that these scores are effective predictors of risk. It also showed that African Americans and Hispanics are substantially overrepresented in the lowest credit scores, and substantially underrepresented in the highest, while Caucasians and Asians are more evenly spread across the scores. The credit scores were also found to predict risk within each of the ethnic groups leading the FTC to conclude that the scoring models are not solely proxies for redlining. The FTC indicated little data was available to evaluate benefit of insurance scores to consumers. The report was disputed by representatives of the Consumer Federation of America, the National Fair Housing Alliance, the National Consumer Law Center, and the Center for Economic Justice, for relying on data provided by the insurance industry. All states have provisions in their rate regulation laws or in their Fair Trade Practice Acts that prohibit unfair discrimination, often called redlining, in setting rates and making insurance available. In determining premiums and premium rate structures, insurers consider quantifiable factors, including location, credit scores, gender, occupation, marital status, and education level. However, the use of such factors is often considered to be unfair or unlawfully discriminatory and the reaction against this practice has in some instances led to political disputes about the ways in which insurers determine premiums and regulatory intervention to limit the factors used. An insurance underwriter's job is to evaluate a given risk as to the likelihood that a loss will occur. Any factor that causes a greater likelihood of loss should theoretically be charged a higher rate. This basic principle of insurance must be followed if insurance companies are to remain solvent. Thus, discrimination against, i.e., negative differential treatment of, potential insureds in the risk evaluation and premium setting process is a necessary byproduct of the fundamentals of insurance underwriting. For instance, insurers charge older people significantly higher premiums than they charge younger people for term life insurance. Older people are thus treated differently from younger people, i.e., a distinction is made, discrimination occurs. The rationale for the differential treatment goes to the heart of the risk a life insurer takes. Old people are likely to die sooner than young people, so the risk of loss, the insured's death, is greater in any given period of time and therefore the risk premium must be higher to cover the greater risk. However, treating insureds differently when there is no actuarially sound reason for doing SWA unlawful discrimination. New assurance products can now be protected from copying with a business method patent in the United States. A recent example of a new insurance product that is patented is usage-based auto insurance. Early versions were independently invented and patented by a major used auto insurance company, Progressive Auto Insurance, and a Spanish independent inventor, Salvador Minguijón Pérez. Many independent inventors are in favor of patenting new insurance products since it gives them protection from big companies when they bring their new insurance products to market. Independent inventors account for 70% of the new U.S. patent applications in this area. Many insurance executives are opposed to patenting insurance products because it creates a new risk for them. The Hartford Insurance Company, for example, recently had to pay $80 million to an independent inventor, Bancorp Services, in order to settle a patent infringement and theft of trade secret lawsuit for a type of corporate-owned life insurance product invented and patented by Bancorp. 
There are currently about 150 new patent applications on insurance inventions filed per year in the United States. The rate at which patents have been issued has steadily risen from 15 in 2002 to 44 in 2006. The first insurance patent to be granted was including another example of an application posted was U.S. 2009025522 Risk Assessment Company. It was posted on March 6, 2009. This patent application describes a method for increasing the ease of changing insurance companies. Insurance on Demand, also IAD, is an insurance service that provides clients with insurance protection when they need, i.e. only episodic rather than on 24-7 basis is typically provided by traditional insurers, for example clients can purchase an insurance for one single flight rather than a longer-lasting travel insurance plan. Certain insurance products and practices have been described as rent-seeking by critics. That is, some insurance products or practices are useful primarily because of legal benefits, such as reducing taxes, as opposed to providing protection against risks of adverse events. Under United States tax law, for example, most owners of variable annuities and variable life insurance can invest their premium payments in the stock market and defer or eliminate paying any taxes on their investments until withdrawals are made. Sometimes this tax deferral is the only reason people use these products. Another example is the legal infrastructure which allows life insurance to be held in an irrevocable trust which is used to pay an estate tax while the proceeds themselves are immune from the estate tax. Muslim scholars have varying opinions about life insurance. Life insurance policies that earn interest, or guaranteed bonus slash nav, are generally considered to be a form of freeba, usury, and some consider even policies that do not earn interest to be a form of garar, speculation. Some argue that Gerar is not present due to the actuarial science behind the underwriting. Jewish rabbinical scholars also have expressed reservations regarding insurance as an avoidance of God's will but most find it acceptable in moderation. Some Christians believe insurance represents a lack of faith and there is a long history of resistance to commercial insurance in Anabaptist communities, Mennonites, Amish, Hutterites, Brethren in Christ but many participate in community-based self-insurance programs that spread risk within their communities. Country-specific articles. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.